Today on the podcast, I'll be talking with Sean Cullen. He's a comedian, actor, singer, and author. He'll be sharing his own journey from writing comedy to writing children's books, and how, despite his levels of success, he still feels like the idea of making it seems always just out of reach. I've had so many close calls with success, like overwhelming success. And I often think, well, maybe I'm just not very good. And that's why these things haven't worked out. Hello and welcome to Why I'll Never Make It. I'm your host, Patrick Oliver Jones. And this podcast features conversations with fellow creatives about the realities of a career in the performing arts. And the website is winmepodcast.com. Since ancient Greece, there have been basically two forms of entertainment, tragedy and comedy. Basically, one makes us cry and the other makes us laugh. Now, it could be argued that anyone can tell a sad story, but it takes a very select group of people that can make us laugh. While sad stories are universal, whether it's someone dying or some of what we're hearing day to day when it comes to coronavirus, comedy, on the other hand, is somewhat subjective and everyone's sense of humor is different. And today's guest certainly tickles my funny bone and I hope he'll tickle yours as well. Sean Cullen and I worked together about five years ago in the musical First Wives Club. But this wasn't actually the first time I had heard of Sean. Back in the 90s, when Mad TV was on the air and creating some absolutely hysterical skits, from time to time they would bring on musical guests. And one of those guests was Corky and the Juice Pigs. And Sean Collin was a member of that Canadian trio musical comedy group. So it was a real thrill for me to work with him during First Wives Club. And I got to see firsthand his comedy at work. And when it comes to work, Sean certainly does stay busy. Not only has he done musical theater, but he's a stand-up comedian. He's done television, radio, produced his own musical albums, and is a children's book author. So he sat down with me and chatted about all of these various avenues of his work. And I had to ask, so which one do you like best? Well, I guess it would be stand-up comedy. It's the most immediate of all those forms. You know, you do it, people react, it's fun. And I guess a close second would be live theater because you do it immediately and get the feeling from the audience immediately. The hardest one, although the most satisfying, I think, is writing books. I've written five novels for young readers, and uh, that is like an endless, lonely you live in an isolation and then finally it's like this what we're going through right now and then suddenly you uh five years later someone walks up to you and says oh i read that book that was nice and that's the only satisfaction you get from it (laughs) right so what is the process normally for writing those books like from start to finish how long does one take well to write it i'd say usually it's around they're about 75,000 words each. So they end up being, I'd say half a year to write six months. And then editing will be another six months to the point where it's ready to be published. So a year in total, uh, I used to write a book a year. I've taken a little time off from it, but that was used to be the case. Well, now you have nothing else to do. I'm not Stephen King. <laughs> Stephen King writes five novels a day. Well, that's because he's just trying to scare the bejesus out of all of us and his, you know, that warped mind. Yes. Congratulations, Mr. King. Bejesus scared. <laughs> right. Now, stand-up comedy is where you started out, but it was more the musical comedy variety with Corky and the Juice Pigs. So do you consider yourself a musical comedian? Uh, the, the weird thing about me is I do music and songs in my show, and I love music and I sing, but I don't play very well. I've only just started playing the guitar and accompany myself. I've always had an accompanist or, or someone else doing the music. So 
it's kind of a weird thing. I should have learned an instrument beyond the voice, but uh, I never got around to it. So now I'm working on the computer. Uh, the uh, the computer? No, I'm working on the uh, uh, the guitar, which is like a computer for old fifteenth century Italian men. Uh, so I'm I'm it's it's an analog computer at best. So uh, I've been doing that, uh, but yeah, music is a huge part of my shows and probably has led me into doing musicals, uh, that I've done a few different musicals and uh, been a part of that. But uh, yeah, it is, uh, I would say I'm a musical comedian, which would, among other comedians, make me into an idiot. But uh, <laughs> and for the purest, it used to be when I started you know, many years ago, about 30 years ago, if you did any music at your show, you were just like a leper. You were like right in there with jugglers and guy and, you know, monkey trainers. Like one step above mime. That, yeah, one step above mime. You were in the mime category, I believe. So the other stand-up comics would be like novelty, novelty act. You know, you'd be like, who's Gallagher? Mm. You know that you'd be right in there with Gallagher. But our music, when we started, and I've always tried to do this, is it's always original like i never do parodies i never take someone else's song switch the lyrics and then that's the joke i i always try and write a song about something and it all is original and that's i think which makes me maybe different from most musical comedians and with your musical comedy that you write are you are you really just trying to elicit a laugh do you ever like maybe input a little message a little theme a little statement in there no it's pure stupidity for the most part. <laughs> I mean, I, what I try and do is say, this is a very serious song about, it's the exact opposite. This is a very serious song about love. And then I'll write about a song about people pooping on each other. You know, so like it, it's that bait and switch. So, you know, usually I like to be, what I love in my favorite comics is their commitment. It's like, I'll pick someone as an example, like Steve Martin or um, Will Ferrell. Like, they're so committed, and that's what makes them extremely funny. So I like to commit hard and to something really stupid. And uh, that seems to be the formula. And is that easier to do in your stand-up act or when you're given a character like a musical theater? Well, I find it very hard in musical theater because somebody's already written the, the lines for you and the, the music is set and you have to be in a certain place or you'll be run over by a piece of the set. You know, <laughs> you can't really improvise at all. I, I did the producers in Toronto and I was Max Bialystok. And uh, the only time that I got to deviate at all is in the second act, it's the 11th hour number where Max recounts the entire show mm. and he's in the jail cell. And there's a point in it where I'm re re reacting, uh, acting all the parts out. And then he stops and sits down and says intermission and just sits there for a few seconds. And so I, in my show version of it, I started talking to the audience about <laughs> things. <laughs> they just loved it. But uh, the people who would send the messages from New York, <laughs> would be like, we wish you'd refrain from doing that. Uh, and I would always get the stink eye from the uh, orchestra leader who was right in front, the music director, because he would have to find out when I was finishing this improvised whatever I was doing and then bring, the, bring them all back in again, bring the orchestra back in again. And he hated me for that. But uh, I finally, you know, was convinced to stop. <laughs> But, yeah, there's not a lot of uh, room for improvisation. No. And that's what I find very difficult about theater, doing, reproducing the same thing over and over again and uh, not, not being able to... You are going to in, you know, color it with your own personality. It's, mm -hmm. It is going to be your version of it, but there's no movement for that. But I went to see... <laughs> I went to see um, the Los Angeles version with uh, Martin Short and Jason Alexander, and they would get 
so many notes from like, because Martin Short would just bring stuffed animals on stage and just fall down or completely undermine every scene. Just like he was just, I'm bored and I'm going to do what I want. <laughs> and they couldn't stop him, you know? I've done some writing for Martin and I love him, but my God, he would be a nightmare, you know? Because Leo is supposed to be this shy, retiring little guy and he'd be coming in and just being Martin Short, you know? And well, well, you don't hire Martin Short and not let him be Martin Short. No, not really. I think that's the problem with TV stars. They are who they are. Poor Jason Alexander, though, I think he was overwhelmed. Well, yeah, because he comes from that musical theater background. So he's used to following a script and sticking with the character. Yeah. Well, there's so many moving parts in a big musical like that. Mm -hmm. Like, you just have to be on your mark and, and they take your, their cues from you and it's all computerized now and everything gets screwed if you do anything wrong. And uh, so, I don't know. I don't know how they handled it. They're like it was insane, but anyway. <laughs> so, so then getting back to stand up, where you get to be you, um, where does your material usually derive from? I, I I do write material. I've grown to write more material. I used to make uh, make things up a lot, but it's really hard to completely do say an hour of stand up with no plan. I think yeah. people's minds need something to hang it on, and they want you to look like you're planned something, you know? And uh, I do improvise a lot while I'm performing, but I usually have a platform of material that I've written and then depart from it as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I do, when I'm writing material, making material, I'm just inspired by the strangest things. And I think, well, this might be funny because today, you know, I was listening, I keep listening to the radio because of the COVID-19 situation. Everybody's on quarantine. And they said today, I'm just, today, there was a, from the postal service, it said, postal workers are still delivering the mail and we, they're doing a great job, but there's no need to greet them or to uh, <laughs> wave and a smile, it's enough. And so I thought, well, that's terrible. You know, and I'm doing this COVID-19 online comedy festival on Twitter where every I put up four two minute bits every day doing comedy. And one of them is uh, it's sad because my postman and I had developed quite a relationship. And many, you know, when we didn't just shake hands, we started shaking hands. But then we started slow dancing every time he brought me mail. It was and it's very intimate. And then uh now we're making love to each other full on every time he brings me <laughs> some mail on the front steps. Other people are joining in from around the, the neighborhood as well. So he puts it in the slot and he, delivers. He does. He licks the stamp, if you know what I'm saying. Right. And <laughs> anyway, so it's just stuff like that that inspires me to make the most ridiculous situation out of it that I can. Usually things that are quite serious. And then I go, oh. Like on this comedy fest, I've been talking a lot about my mother, who's 89, and she's quarantined. And she and I've just said, well, she loves to do MMA fighting, and it's really hard on her. She's doing a lot of training right now, but there's nowhere to get out her, you know, guillotine people in the neighborhood. And you know, I've been, <laughs> I said she's driving, she's dressing as Spider Man and going around the, swinging around the trees and dropping Maltesers into people's mouths from her egg sack. But anyway, all the stuff comes from a very mundane idea. Mm. And then I'll make something completely absurd out of it. And that's the kind of formula that I go by. So in your stand-up, obviously every comedian at some point has been heckled. What's been your worst experience with that? Uh, well, one was I was in Britain and I was doing this character called Dame Sybil Thorndike, who is a real person, but I'm not the way I did it. I just dressed up in drag as an old British woman and I would talk to her. <laughs> I would tell theater anecdotes that are made up, you know, like I was raised by um, uh, on the streets of London. I, uh, I lived with canal boat people and we'd drink paint. We had nothing to eat but paint. You know, it's just stupid stories. Uh, but uh, I was doing this and a woman said, 
a woman said to me with a really thick West Indian accent, something, Jaws. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I, and I couldn't figure it out. And finally she said, show us your drawers was what she was trying to say, but it just sounded like Jawas. And I was like, do you like Star Wars? What is it? And the, slowly the audience turned against me because it made me look like I was mocking this woman for being from the West Indies. <laughs> Not good. Uh, bad, I did a show at a, I don't like hecklers. And I, I, you know, I don't think any comics really love it. The funny thing is, not in any other art form are people heckling. Mm. Like, not since Shakespeare's time have you been in a theater and heard someone go, hey, I don't believe that, Hamlet. You don't really look sad. You know, no one does that. <laughs> but yeah. in comedy, they're like, absolutely. Uh, you're an idiot. I hate you. And all that stuff. And, and people, I had a guy online just the other day. He said he, he kind of made fun of what I was doing with the festival and I said well that's fun you know I you're the first person to give me a negative response and I, congratulations and he said well I know how you guys need hecklers to keep you sharp and I'm like that's a common misconception uh do you <laughs> like doctors do you have someone sitting there beside them kind of poking them in the uh ribs while they're doing some surgery just to keep them sharp oh missed that appendix whoa it, got, got it explained but you know what I kept you sharp uh, nobody does that, but uh, nobody heckles any other art, really. And it, yeah. because, and I think it's because everybody thinks they have a sense of humor. It's not like anything else. If you're an actor, people are going, oh, he's acting. And that's something I can't do. I'm not an actor. But everybody thinks they're funny. It doesn't matter who they are or mm. how unfunny they are. Everybody thinks they have a sense of humor. So they can judge you and interrupt you and <laughs> put their two cents in because they have a great sense of humor. And it's one of the weirdest things. I, we're trying to get a um, stand-up comedy union together, much like uh, AFTRA or okay. Equity here in Canada. And they're trying to be recognized as an art form. And I'm like, well, I don't know if it's an art form. Like, it, it's a craft, yeah. It's not the same. It's not the same. And because it's so humor is so accessible to everybody in their bag of tricks, it's hard to say, but I'm an artist. You know, it's, it's, uh, if you're a painter, you've learned to paint and then you're making decisions in painting. Mm -hmm. I, it, there's a, there's a process and, uh, it's hard. It's hard for me to go full bore with. Yes. It's an art form. It's, you know, I, th I think it would, I think it has to do with who the comedian is. Like, I immediately thought of Ellen because, like, the way that she writes, and specifically one of her, one of her stand-ups. I think, I think it was uh, here and now. I think, but it's w basically she starts with one point, drifts way far from it, and then comes back full circle and ends the same place she started. So, crafting an hour-long yeah. theme like that, you know, does take some art. And so, I think the art comes in the writing. It comes in the writing and the structuring of the set. But sure. then once you're on stage, yeah, it is so much you. It's it's Sean on stage. And so I I I kind of get what you're saying that it is hard to to nail it into hard to classify it because it takes from a lot of different disciplines. Yeah. Writing, acting, and uh it's what when I started out, I only went into it because I went to acting school, uh, acting university bachelor of fine arts acting course and i was kicked out after three years because they said you just don't have what it takes you know and i wasn't Ooh. a great disciplined actor right you've seen that we've worked together <laughs> and uh so i just i went to comedy because i feel sorry for actors not because of who they are but because of their process is you have to find someone to give you the job you have to have someone to say, you're the person who gets to do its art today. And in my comedy, I can write myself something and perform it almost immediately with no kind of interface. You know, it, it's, it's a lot more immediate and, and no one can deny me for 
being too tall, too short, too fat, too Caucasian, to, you know, whatever it is that I'm not right for that. I'm right for my own stuff and I can write it for myself, you know. But that's what the hecklers are there to make fun of all those. That's right. That's They're keeping what you they sharp. Bring. Keeping me honest, keeping me sharp. That comedian union Sean was talking about is actually called the Canadian Association of Stand Up Comedians. And it was co-founded in 2017 by comedian Sarah Battaglia to represent the first ever unified voice for stand-up comics in Canada. In 2019, the membership was expanded to include all Canadian comedians. Because Sean is in a long line of great comedians that came from Canada. There's, of course, the great ones from Saturday Night Live, Phil Hartman. Mike Myers, even the executive producer, Lauren Michaels himself, Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara from Schitt's Creek, comedy movie stars like Seth Rogen and Leslie Nielsen, and of course, Jim Carrey. Sean had mentioned Martin Short. One of my favorite Canadian imports is the comedy troupe Kids in the Hall, as well as Sean's own group, Corky and the Juice Pigs. They began performing in the late 1980s, touring various Canadian university campuses. But here in the U.S., they're best known for their performances on Mad TV. So, of course, I had to ask Sean if he was Corky or the Juice Pick. Well, people ask that, and we tried to say that it was like Charlie from Charlie's Angels. We were all the angels, and there was a Charlie. So we were not... None of us was Corky. Ah. So this led to, you know, when people would come up to me after a show and go, hey, Corky, you were great. People would give me, like the other two guys were quite annoyed by that sort of thing. Well, as Juice Pig should be. Yes, yeah, Juice Pig should be. They have every right to be respected. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, we had no Corky, per se. No Corky. No one was the main persona. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because you you all uh, rotated as far as solos. Then did you all write together? Or was it like one of you would write a solo piece and two two of us wrote a lot, one of us didn't. So we just kind of took it upon ourselves to write material, and then we'd probably improvise parts in it. Like we'd write a, a thing, and then find our place in it, the where we fit. And then write and improvise or write our own verse for a song, say, or for a sketch. Mm. We'd write our own character. But usually, uh, Greg and I did a lot of the writing in the show. The two big juice pigs. The big, the tallest of all. Yeah. <laughs> now, when it comes to, um, to stand up comedies, they say that some of the best comedians came out of a, a tragedy in their life that spurred them into comedy. Was there an event, a disappointment, a challenge in your life that, that maybe propelled you into comedy? I was violated by a sea turtle as a child. Aren't we all? Aren't we all? No, I didn't. And I, you know, I can't say that there was something specific. Uh, my, my, fa my family life was not idyllic. And, my dad uh, was an alcoholic and there was a lot of kind of tension in the house. And it led you to kind of be observant of people's emotions and how you could avoid ups upsetting people. And, and that kind of observation led to me doing comedy, I think, being aloof, uh, staying out of trouble and watching from a distance and... I think the comics a lot of the time are that kind of dual mentality where they want the love and affection, but they don't want the tight, like the, the immediate person to person isn't as important as a group's adulation for you. And so, so attention versus intimacy is that kind of, yeah, exactly. Adulation versus intimacy. You'd like to be adulated but you have very few intimate friends and you and like you build a persona on stage that is not what you are really. And people, when people see me do comedy, I'm very bombastic and, you know, very uh, confident and forceful for the most part. And I'm not that way at all in my own life. Yeah. Like I'm very me, not meek, but I, I'm not uh, outgoing and I'm not like, I don't walk into a room and say, Hey, everybody. I'm just like, no, <laughs> that's not me. I'm, 
I'm very retiring for the most part. So in your personal life, do you, or when you're out in public and you're just doing your own thing, do you feel a need to always be on? Not at all. No, I was with certain people, friends that know me, I can be more outgoing, but I don't really try to be, (laughs) that's not absolutely true. If someone's being incredibly serious, I like to interject (laughs) and say something stupid whenever possible. (laughs) but I'm not a, an always on type of person. I'm, I'm not making jokes constantly, you know, I'm not annoying. I'd like to think anyway. Yeah. And it, I think it's something you learn to stop doing as you get older. It's like, I don't know, it's a job like anything else. It's like plumbing. You don't want to go home and fix the toilet. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You, if you're a plumber, you want everything. You just want to sit on the couch and watch TV, you know, or have another hobby that has nothing to do with what your your work and your your livelihood is. Yeah. So I I I am humorous to be around, but I don't like perform for my friends and for people at random, you know. Yeah. I mean that w- I would say that that was one thing that I noticed about you in doing First Wives Club was that you're on stage, you know, Marty had to be this kind of bigger than life and kind of goofball. Uh, but at the same time, when we would go backstage, you and I would certainly have silly conversations, but then you would also open up about your personal life or this or that, and we would have actual like meaningful conversations. And so I think it's, it's good to see both sides of, of a comedian like that, because you're right. Like a lot of times when we, what we see on stage is just one facet of the person. Well, yeah. I mean, if everybody is all about their work they're not interesting to me you know Mm -hmm. and you know i just there's nothing more annoying than someone who never stops as a comedian like i know people like that and i'm just like this will not be my close friend (laughs) they because they don't really allow you to see who they really are they see you're you're seeing their persona their stage persona all the time right and um i don't know my, I'm a quite a serious person. I, uh, I can't say I'm. Yeah, I guess I am. I don't. I'm not a goofball. I mean, I do want to be fun and have good uh, conversations and do fun things, but I'm not like a cut up. You know, that's not me really. Like you said, you you take serious subjects and then put a little poopy spin on them. Poopy spin is what they called me in high school. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, mm-hmm. exactly. But that's because in the shower, I well, spin and poop, yeah, on everyone. <laughs> well, then they had to shower again. Well, it's at least I was there. You just do the waffle stomp, get rid of the poop, get yeah. it down the drain, and there you are. And then move on with your day, right? That's right. That's right. Um, th- see, I I try to stay on track, and then you and then you sorry take take me down a path. Uh, let's see. So then with regards to that, is that another reason why, or is that one of the reasons why you like writing books so much? Because it's, it gives you a chance to kind of break out of that persona and actually be a little bit more with yourself and deliver these ideas. Well, it was very challenging starting to write books. I was approached to write them. I, I, they're published by Penguin in Canada. And just, I love books. Like I love reading. I absolutely love it. And uh, as a kid, that was what I did. Like I just disappeared into books all the time. And I thought this will be great, but I wanted to bring, it was really hard to write down words on a page that are never going to change. Like my job as a comedian is so far removed from that. Like Mm. every show someone sees of mine will be different in some way. It's going to be just because the audience is different or I, and I always say things differently and do things differently. So it's it's not the same trying to write down prose and know that it's going to be set on page and that's going to be it. You know, I can't influence it once it's done. And that was really hard to get around. And I wanted to bring humor into the book. The first book I wrote was called Hamish X and the Cheese Pirates. And it was about a boy who is in an orphanage And they make cheese there because there's an evil guy who runs the place who wants to make the finest cheese and he uses these kids as as, uh, orphan labor. 
And one day they're attacked by cheese pirates who gather the great cheesemakers of the world and then their recipes and attempt to steal all of that. Stupid, weird. But uh, I, I, what I did when I came to that, I wanted to bring humor to it and keep it uh, unpredictable. And one way I did was I had footnotes. There was a narrator who narrated the whole book and he constantly interjects in the story with footnotes about important historical data or that is all made up or, you know, mm-hmm. weird facts and, you know, stuff like that. And the story is very, it takes strange turns and very weird. I, I kind of modeled it where I'd like to, I love Roald Dahl. So I wanted it to be like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory-esque or, you know, weird in that chitty chitty bang bang kind of strange way, you know. Mm. So bringing that to the book is really hard because the book is printed, it's done, you know, and you can't fix it once it's out there. And I cringe reading them and I go, oh, that was the thing I should have done better. You know, I'm sure, but that's the hardest thing for writers, I think, that to ever be finished with their work. Right, because you can always make it better, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You would always think you can make it better, but that's what editing is for. They're there to say, stop doing things. You're ruining this now. <laughs> it's getting worse. It's stop. getting worse now. Is it, yeah, what is that process like? Because your stand-up, it's you, and you get to be the final editor, but now you're working with someone else who is that censor for you. How is that? It's very strange at first, but usually good editors are there to facilitate you, not to block you. Uh, I've had both experiences, and uh, good at it, good editors point out the strengths and enhance them. And uh, it's very strange to hand your work over to somebody to be judged, you know. And mm. and it's very heart wrenching in a lot of ways. And the things you think are great, and they're like, "There's a reason why this doesn't work." And you go, "Well, if you can explain it to me, I'll accept it." And then you good good editors do. Uh, so it's not terrible. It, it's a, it's, it's a fun process. On one hand, it's why I like working with. Um, when you're a stand-up, you're alone all the time. You travel alone. You stay in hotel rooms alone. You're alone. You're alone. You do your work alone. All of that. You see a few people uh, backstage every once in a while, but when you're writing a book, you're alone. But you're collaborating with an editor. And collaboration is something that stand-up comics don't get to do very often. Mm. And that's why I like doing musicals and doing theater because it's collaborative and you're with people and you're working together to make something and you're only, it's only as good as the sum of its parts. Right. And that's a different kind of satisfying experience. You know, the, what I find hardest about the theater is when you get into nine, the ninth month of doing the producers and your mind is doing the show, like your body is doing the show and there's a part of your mind that is cruising along doing it. And then half of your mind is like, I really want to get uh, nachos after the show tonight. Mm-hmm. And I got to do my laundry and uh, God, I could take a shit right now. I'm really out of trouble. You like you 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 become an automaton in a lot of the time, mm-hmm. and it, it it's like every actor I'm sure feels this way. Maybe some love it. Maybe I think there's the security in that too. There's the security in being a show for a year or being in Cats for five years or whatever it is you're going to do. But for me, after the first week, I'm like, I've done this. <laughs> now, it's drudgery. You know, it's mm. like, oh my god, I love opening night, and that pull towards opening night and everything's going crazy and then you're like oh, oh, oh. but we've done this right we've, we've done this now we have to do it 178 more times yeah that gets that gets old <laughs> that, that, that's just me personally do you find that same uh need to move on from your own material like 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 you'll do you know you'll go through and you'll find success with certain jokes or certain scenarios that you come up with and now it's like okay i've done that for a year put it away yeah 
I mean, uh, when I first started doing solo stuff, like people always ask me to do Corgi and the Juice Pigs material. I don't do any of it in my show because I did that and I did it with three people and that's what it was meant for, to be done. Yeah. That's the way it was meant to be done. So I don't do any of it. So I started writing my own stuff. And when I look back at what I wrote back then, some of it was good and some of it is of its time and some... I was a different person and that's why it worked. You know, think about comedy as if you're writing it, you have to believe it and embody it at the moment you're performing. Mm. And if you're doing the same material you're doing 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you're dead inside and you're dead as a performer. You're not moving. And I always am making new material. Like I just finished writing a, a new hour of stand-up because i had to do the just for laughs in toronto is doing a festival so i had to come up with an hour so i got up on stage and from five minute bit by five minute bit i assembled an hour learned to play the guitar for a couple of songs changed some things and if you're not growing and changing it's it's just a job and that you'll quit because that's that's it's deadly. It's deadly boring when you're not moving. And have you ever yeah. thought yourself about quitting? Is there any point? I've been, I don't know. It's been funny. You know, I've had so many close calls with success, like overwhelming success. And I often think, well, maybe I'm just not very good. And that's why these things haven't worked out. Maybe that's the problem. Like I had a deal. I did Just for Lives in 1998, and then I got a deal with CBS Television to develop and write a sitcom for myself. So I did. I helped write a script uh, with a guy named Mark Driscoll, who was great. He worked on Ellen's first series, and uh, uh. he. We wrote this thing, and it was read for Les Moonves. We read it with a, a, an acting like John Cryer, Tony Shalhoub me i was just like what the hell but this was all before they were huge right well john cryer was just before two and a half men tony shalhoub it was before monk before he became really what he is now which is great he's always been great but we read it didn't happen uh so wrote, and then i wrote another one and les moon just didn't like it because there was a monkey in it and there was a <laughs> monkey featured in it, and he doesn't like monkeys He's afraid of them. <laughs> so this is the kind of precarious things that things hang on. And then, then while I was in that second year of C at CBS, I was under contract for a year. And I went and did a benefit for uh, the Phil Hartman Foundation, which is for young stand-up comics uh, to kind of like a scholarship in Canada. And uh, I was there. Lauren Michael saw me, invited me down to Saturday Night Live. Not Saturday Night Live per se, but to do a showcase in a, for their writers for Saturday Night Live. So I did it at, I think it was Stand Up New York. Anyway, I did my set and they came up to me afterwards. They're like, well, we'd love you to be on the show this season. And I said, well, I'm under contract to CBS. Can you help me get out of that? They said, well, you get out of it and give us a call. And I'm like, oh, I can't get out of it. So I missed that. Did you try and once you got out of contract? They weren't interested again. It was strange. Mm. Just that lightning in a bottle that I threw out the window. And, uh, you know, things like that. And then I was about to sign with NBC, a deal, which well, they were really high on me. And it was great. And I went in for the meeting and it was fantastic. And said, we'll get some paperwork together. We'll see you tomorrow. And then that was September 10th, 2001. So the next day <sighs> was the best day of all time. Right. And all oh. television ceased to exist at that point. So I was done again. And uh, so you just have to, I don't know, I like the work. That's the thing. But often you feel like, oh, what am I going to do to retire? Especially when I've been divorced and all of my money has been, you know, distributed among people who really deserve it more than I do. You go like, what What old man am I going to be? I, I, you get fear. You get the fear in you. But then mm -hmm. you say, well, all I can do to deal with that fear is to make more things, to make things. Like when this COVID-19 thing started, I was like, geez, everything I've got has been canceled. 
So I'm going to go online four times a day and do two minutes of weird comedy and make a festival called the COVID-19 online comedy fest. Yeah. And so I went on Twitter and I did it. I do it every day for the duration. I don't know. It gets weird. I talk to <laughs> However potatoes. long it lasts. Yeah. However long it lasts. I'm talking yeah. to potatoes. I have dolls. I do lots of things. But have you been bringing other comedians into this festival? Ask them to. I've said put out the call, but absolutely no one has answered it. So I feel good. But uh, um, well, I, I I know a comedian. I interviewed one in January. I'll put him in touch, and maybe he maybe he'll give you a little something. Well, all I just it's just to put up posts for yourself and use the hashtag and you know be part of an online movement. I thought I'd start yeah. one. But everything I start tends to fail. But that's all right. Uh, if someone cooler was doing it, like if Patton Oswalt said, it's time. And everybody would be like, yes, Patton, may I crawl inside you and be you. But yeah. that, that's not me. Yeah, because you've had three shows that are named after you. The Sean Cullen Show, you've had Simply Sean, and then the mm -hmm. Sean Show. Sean Chow. Sean Chow. There we go. Sean Chow. So is this is this part of a, a branding strategy? It's like, I'm Sean, remember me. Well, it's a way of making sure that no network will ever pick it up because your name is on it and they can't <laughs> fire you from it. Uh, so the Sean, Sean Cullen show was a six episode run in, on CBC in Canada. People were absolutely frightened and horrified by the show. It was kind of like if Jack Benny uh dropped acid and weird people came out of the floor that was the show and it was kind <laughs> of like an homage to old time tv where i lived in a house and then all these characters coming in and out and it was so weird but i think like that was in 2003 and i think if i'd done it now people would be like oh that old thing you know, it was just way ahead of its time in a lot of ways. And I was the first thing I'd ever written. I wrote all the episodes and it was hard. And I've learned a lot more about the process, but it was really fun. Then Simply Sean was a CBC radio series that I did every summer for about four years where I would play music that I liked, uh, indie music and stuff, and then talk um, in between, just ramble about, whatever came to my mind and people really enjoyed it because they'd be sitting at their cottage and or their cabin and <laughs> on a saturday morning at 10 a.m and you know i'd be making up things about the horses and stuff and they'd love that and uh the sean Shaw was a live talk show that i had where i'd have guests come on and uh i'd interview them and we'd do little sketches sometimes and uh, mm -hmm. it was kind of like a you know, a standard talk show, but right. with a little band that was great. And it was really fun. Like if you could go back and, and looking at the different things that you've, that you've done, is there one that if I could keep doing that, that's what I would want to do. Or if that show had been a hit, I could have done that for 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. The Sean Cullen show was the thing I dreamed of doing. And it was a thing where we did say, these are the kind of episodes. We had one episode, I no, don't know if you've ever heard of Toller Cranston, mm -mm. but he's a great figure skater, extremely gay man and extremely flaming. <laughs> and it was the first guy to do really elaborate ice dancing and flaming costumes and the whole thing. And, you know, before, you know, they would just say he's eccentric, you know? Yeah. But, but now he'd be completely at the forefront of everything. Right. But he was like, uh, the idea of this, the one episode was I lived in this house and I had an evil woman who lived next door who tried to destroy me every week with some weird plot. And one of them was called the Tollersman. And it was a talisman shaped like Toller Cranston, like she delivers it to me. And I can make wishes come true. And every time I make a wish, though, a figure skater dies. Right? <laughs> so we kept making these wishes. Like, I want a pony. And a pony would appear. And then we'd hear on the news, there'd be... Brian Boitano, done. Brian Boitano exploded. And we'd just show Brian Boitano exploding on the glass in a, in a ring. It was really fun. And, and we'd have guests on, like celebrities who'd walk on and be part of the show. And that, for me, was like as random and fun as I... And we had a band, live band, that lived in the house that just sat in the corner. And whenever I needed them, they'd play and I'd sing a song. 
and it was really fun. Like that was my, that was my dream. And I, uh, you know, it'll never happen again. Well, it sounds like the kind of show that I can see a network television be like, what do we do with this? Well, the thing about Canada is, and every time, like there's so many comedians from Canada that live in the United States now. Mm-hmm. And the thing is all Canadians, they think they have this great sense of humor because Jim Carrey comes from there. But we, like everybody always asks me in every interview, why are Canadians so funny? And I'm like, you know what? They're not very funny. They really haven't got a very broad sense of humor. Like, they, with a, like they're not uh, eccentrically funny. They're, they're, they like when someone puts a wig on and pretends to be the prime minister. Like there's shows like that on Canadian television where it's like dress up as politicians. Yeah, which is very European, uh, you know, British type of humor. Yeah, and uh, but it's also like from 1950. The thing is, Canada's have got a population of about 35 million people, and if you have a fringe hit that appeals to an esoteric part of the country, which is what most comedy are until everyone loves them and learns what they are and how to laugh at them. Like Seinfeld started with very poor ratings, Mm -hmm. but once he'd educated people into what was funny about what they were doing, it became the biggest show of all time. You don't get that chance in Canada. You don't get the chance to educate the audience and not be canceled after the first three episodes if it's not going well, because you have to spend the same amount of money on a show that 40,000 people are watching as you would on a million people's show. And what's more economical for you? The million people's show. So you make the most middle of the road, easy to digest, and most obvious comedies you can. And so we're still doing sitcoms, which doesn't make any sense to me because no one's doing sitcoms, really. Yeah. Not in the standard sense. Like there was a movement a couple of years ago where like, we'd like to get like live audience sitcoms. I'm like, no, you, no, you don't. I mean, we want to be the office. We don't want to be, you know, uh, still standing. Like we, we, we don't want to be tool time. Like that's right. over. It's over. The death of the sitcom has been forecasted repeatedly over the decades. Like back in 1983, when Warren Littlefield, who was then the entertainment president at NBC, said the half-hour comedy was dead. And in more recent years, the TV comedy has been pronounced dead by Entertainment Weekly in 1999, New York Times in 2007, The Hollywood Reporter in 2014, and in 2018, The Guardian said sitcoms seem stuck in the 70s. Is there still a place for them in today's world? Yet time and time again, a sitcom seems to come along and capture the nation. The most recent, Big Bang Theory, which, like Seinfeld, started off with low ratings but ended as the longest-running multi-camera comedy in television history, just ahead of Cheers. But one thing is for certain, sitcoms come and go and many more fail than ever succeed. And the same can certainly be said for musical theater. So I asked Sean some of his favorite moments from the stage. I, I've been lucky enough to play two Zero Mistel's roles. I did, there's a festival here in Strat, in Canada called Stratford uh, Shakespeare Festival, which puts on Shakespeare and also does a couple of musicals every year. And I did, um, funny thing happened on the way to the forum, I got mm-hmm. to do Pseudolus, which is one of the great comedy pieces. That, that, that play is fantastic. And, so that I really enjoyed, but also be, a lot because I got this one moment where I've managed to carve out an improvisational section where he has to drink poison at the end and kill himself. Okay. Uh, it all ends up to being that. He has to drink poison in front of everyone, so he can't fake it. He's got to do it. So I took that and made it into, I drink the poison, and then my body goes through a number of different, uh, sequences. <laughs> there's gas. There's bloating. There's ex- you know. There's tr- like writhing. It went on for quite a while, and I really enjoyed that. Um, Was it something different every night? 
Oh, yes. I try to make it different because my goal often in life is to make the other performers. Always. Performers. You want to make them crack up and yeah. break character. Of course. Well, when we were doing a First Wives Club, my favorite time would be when we were shooting the commercial and I'd come out and I'd be facing back and everybody else would be out. And what was it? It was Dante. Dante, do you want some kale? <laughs> <laughs> so I'd try and say that to people and they would you'd try and crack them up. And I forget, she was lovely. I forget what her name is. She was one of the girls in the little majorette costumes. Um, Rachel Tessa. No, it was Tessa. And I'd always be working on her to make her laugh. And she was a good mark. Yeah. She was great. Because she she's very musical theater dancer and she, she stays in character pretty well. But yeah, if you could get her, it's good. It'd be fun. But I love, that's what I, you know, I don't get that opportunity when I'm alone on stage as a stand up. Mm-hmm to have that kind of camaraderie. And that's the, one of the best things, the friendships and the, the interactions that I just don't get when I'm doing my solo stuff. Yeah. Now, you've also been on game shows as well. And I must admit, one of my personal all-time favorite game shows is Match Game. And in Canada, they had a, a reboot or remount of that show. How, how was it being uh, one of the regular panelists on Match Game? Well, it was amazing, incredibly fun. It's such a fun game because there's no game, really. It's just people trying to fit sexual innuendo into every blank, right? Right. And the contestants are uniformly stupid. (laughs) And they never make the right choice. And it's hilarious. And I loved it. Like, I I wasn't supposed to be regular. I, I, they said, well, we'll let you do the first week of shows, which we'd shoot five in a day. Uh, and that would be a week's run. And so I shot the first five and they're like, all right, you're the bottom right guy. So everything, you just watch it all coming and you get to just do some absolutely weird thing at the end that was just so much fun. So it was incredibly fun. Like I, I, that's something I wish had gone on but the thing is, we did two seasons. We shot two seasons, and then they rolled, rolled it, and rolled it, and rolled it, and kept showing it over and over again. And then, instead of bringing us back for more, this is what happens in Canada. They just bought the American version with Alec Baldwin and put it on the Comedy Network. So oh. they didn't need us anymore. It's cheaper to buy it than to make it. It's always the case. It was fun when it lasted. Yeah. So what's upcoming for you? Obviously, you have this online Twitter festival that you're doing for COVID. I'm but uh, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is keeping you busy. But uh, is there anything in the pipe that once once COVID is behind us that you can kind of get back to? Well, I'm trying to write a, a I'm developing a new television show. It's a sitcom, but something d- a little darker. It's about a man and his uh, depression. I'm clinically depressed. I take uh, medication and stuff like that. So I uh, thought, what I've always thought is that a man, <laughs> that depression is like the most awesome looking person in the world, and the best actor in the world, like Brad Pitt or whatever, just telling you you're worthless all the time. And you just go, oh, well, he's, uh, it's Brad Pitt. He's probably right. He seems to believe it. And that, so the concept is that I am a person who suffers from depression and you can see my depression as this handsome man who follows me around everywhere and talks to my ear and tells me how (laughs) worthless I am all the time or interferes with my interactions with other people. No one else can see him but me. And he's kind of my constant companion. It's kind of like an evil uh, Harvey the, the (laughs) Harvey the rabbit. So, that I'm trying to work on. I'm working on a new novel. I want to write a novel for my daughter. I've written five novels, three for my one son, Hamish, two with a character named Brendan for my son, Brendan. And so Cleopatra is my daughter and she hasn't got a book yet. So I'd like to write one for her. And uh, I haven't been performing stand up enough. So I'm working on that. I'm going uh, to start touring again. And uh, I'm just trying to make lots of projects and make things and fill my oh, days that's great. with joy. 
So, so when it comes to that, that depression, that voice, is that something that you hear as you write stuff? Do, it, or do you ever have to kind of overcome it? For sure. Like, it's really hard. You know what's horrible for it is Twitter. If people say things on Twitter about you, they can't, no one knows who they are. You can't be seen. And uh, you get time to think up your next cutting remark. Whereas if you're a heckler in this club, a comedian just has the microphone. That's something you just grow to learn. You have the microphone, and all you have to do is just be louder than that guy and uh, ignore them, really, because all they want is some attention, you know. But, uh, what, yeah, you know, let's say when I was coming into, I always fear that I'm not worthy, you know, that I don't deserve this prop, this opportunity. Like when I got First Wives Club, I'm like, oh, maybe I'm just not very good. This constant dialogue of like, I, like I had trouble with the dancing. I'm not a great dancer. And so I would beat myself up about the dancing constantly. I'm like, maybe I don't deserve to be in the company of, Morgan Weed or, you know, these, like, all the girls who were, and the guys who were in the chorus who were just so accomplished, like, mm -hmm. you, you, especially in the theater where I'm slumping around and I see these kids who can do it all. And I'm like, this, the, 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 the character actor in the show, and I'm getting paid more doing all the, you know, you just like, Oh, it's so easy to feel unworthy, you know, in situations like that. But you buy a battle against it. Take some medication. Everything's good. Well, I am certainly glad that you pushed through it because you you certainly make me laugh. And I know you make other people laugh. So I'm glad that uh, you're sticking with it and doing what you love. Well, that's me, Mr. Doing What He Loves. Well, thank you for joining me and Sean today. To find out more about him, you can look for links in the show notes for ways to connect with him via Twitter and his website, as well as links to some of his stand-up and the hilarious rendition of Gay Eskimo by Corky and the Juice Pigs. I'm your host, Patrick Oliver Jones. Don't forget the next episode where I'll be asking Sean the final five questions. Well, as we end the episode today, I wanted to leave you with one of Sean's own compositions from his musical CD, I Am a Human Man. This is The Beach Song. Grab your board and grab your girl. This beach is the best beach in the world. Tell everybody to bring their friends. Don't you worry that it's being condemned. If you go out swimming in the sandy shoals, you'll be bleeding from every hole. It's just down the shore from a sewer pipe. And on a hot summer day, it gets smell pretty right. We're going down to Forgotten Beach. Some people say it's Forgotten Beach. Both swim there, then get sick and die. Forgotten Beach brings a tear to my eye. So please the cool kids go better than Waikiki or Kokomo. Diapers buried in the sand. Hypodermic needles sticking through your hand. The water has a bleachy taste. Try to ignore the toxic waste. Well, the sand is greasy from an oil spill. If hepatitis don't catch it, the mutant a tear to my eye and when the sun goes down your sores will start to glow walk with your special girl till your gums start bleeding and your hair falls out forgotten beach is so bitching you just want to shine I forgot about my podcast, which I do. Uh, it's called The Sean Pod, and it's gone through many iterations from live performance to uh, to just me in my room 
talking to the uh, recorder, which is uh, just my saddest moments usually. But people I've been uh, surprising. I've done almost 200 episodes. And it's, it's one thing that's been a constant in the last 10 years. So I really enjoy it. And so if you want to uh, subscribe, it's absolutely free. The Sean Pod on iTunes.com.